So the three closest decades would be the 2000s, the 1970s, and the 1940s. Uh, those were generally the inflationary commodity boom decades. Uh, and obviously they had very different magnitudes. So the 2000s were considered a rather favorable decade. Uh, and part of why you had a commodity boom is that you had the rise of the, the quote unquote brick nation. So Brazil, Russia, India, China, you, had a, you know, you had a dollar weakness. Uh, and so that, that contributed to an emerging market boom. And they had a, a rapid increase in their commodity consumption at a time when commodity supplies were rather constrained. And so you had a big, you know, you had a big uptick in commodity prices, but it was generally for the mo most part a good thing. Right. It was, it was it was kind of all, well, not that those price increases were good, but that it was happening for rather good reasons. A lot. You know, the world was was in some ways booming. Uh, now, that eventually turned into the subprime mortgage crisis uh, and that also, you know, high oil prices contribute uh, to the recession we eventually had in, in 2008. Uh, and so by the end of that period, it was it was it was negative. Um, but overall, that that's that's kind of the in some cases, the the, the best example you can think of. Another, the, the one prior to that, the big commodity boom before that would be the 70s. And that's where you had severe supply constraints because, so the United States found oil in the, in the you know, the kind of the second half of the 1800s. We had almost a century of just constant increase in our annual oil production. Occasional, you know, you dip, but it was a, a structural increase. And that peaked in 1970. So in 1970, U.S. oil production peaked and started to roll over structurally. Uh, at the same time as baby boomers uh, across the world, including the U.S., were coming into home buying years. Um, and so you had basically a lot of commodity demand uh, and you had limited commodity supply. So the United States became more reliant on Middle Eastern oil. And so that opened up all sorts of geopolitical conflicts uh, and shortages and inflation. Uh, and so that that was a big issue. Now, that part of what alleviated part of why we had low commodity prices recently is because the U.S.'s structural decline in energy production reversed because of shale. So we added a lot of new energy to the to the world. Uh, that seems like it's probably behind us. Like we're still obviously producing a lot of shale, but we're not kind of rapidly increasing our shale production. We're kind of you know maybe not at the limits, but we're we're closer to the limits in terms of how much annual oil production we can we can produce. But anyway, so you know so you had two thousands, you had the nineteen seventies, and if you go back before then. I've been using the 1940s as my closest macro comparison in terms of fiscal monetary policy. Kind of the reasons for inflation were more, you know, in the 70s, the inflation was bank lending driven. You had you had demographics boom. Uh, and then of course, fiscal added fuel to the fire. You had the guns and butter program and you had Vietnam War. But a lot of that inflation was bank lending driven. In the 40s, a lot of it was uh, purely war spending. So banks were not lending much. Uh, people had hardship. And a lot of the inflation and commodity price spikes you saw were obviously because of fiscal stimulus to support the war effort, right? So, uh, and so that was a, a very big year for commodities. And you had price controls, you had you had wage controls, you had kind of shortages. People had to substitute things. They're even, you know, they would literally change what physical coins are made of to try to conserve, uh, you know, more important commodities. That's, that's how extreme it gets in some of those decades. And so I do think we're going into, you know, I've already been in the commodity bull market camp for the 2020s. And if we're going to have outright war, uh, you know, I've been using the 40s comparison. I always kind of say, hopefully there won't be like, you know, the kinetic war. But now if we're actually moving into the kinetic war, then it's even, unfortunately even closer to the 1940s because you have those, those geopolitically driven commodity shortages. So I, I think we are, in a rather challenging decade. Uh, okay. And that was my view before the war, and the war just adds to that view. Now, I don't think it'll be a straight line. I mean, if you look at the 40s and the 70s, right, it's not like just inflation was just constantly going up the entire decade. You had periods where it looked like it was getting better, and then it would get worse again, and then it would get better again, then it would get worse again. Uh, and so I, you know, my base case would be to see the 2020s do the same thing, where, you know, there might, you know, High commodity prices can eventually trigger a recession and hurt demand for commodities. And then you can get a cool off in prices and then you can get stimulus and then you can get higher. You know, you can get another uptick in terms of their prices. And so I, I think this will be cyclical to some extent. Uh, but I think that the the structural backdrop will be one of, of less abundance. We can kind of characterize. So the past 25 years have been characterized by abundance in the sense that 
you know, the world was able to just sacrifice, you know, we didn't have to worry about resiliency. We just, you know, supply chains were emphasize, emphasizing efficiency over resiliency. Everything was just in time delivery, lean manufacturing, do everything you can to, you know, minimize your inventory because that's efficient and it, it boosts your return on invested capital for a company. Before we continue, help us clicking that YouTube like button and subscribe now to our channel. This shows the algorithm that you valued this information. And it helps us spread that message. Sharing is caring. And now, let's continue. And so we, we've kind of assumed global peace, no, no geopolitical issues. We're all going to kumbaya get together. Uh, and as we enter a world where that's not the case anymore, we have to put more resiliency into our supply chains, more duplication, right? So if you, if you have... If you duplicate things, it's inherently less efficient uh, and more inflationary, but more resilient. And so I think that because we've in some ways kind of enjoyed artificial uh, abundance, uh, where it's just it, it was not designed to handle any shock, whether it's a whether it's a pandemic, whether it's a war, doesn't matter. It's just not not designed to handle any shock. And so it's inevitable that that period was going to end one way or another. Now, the specific way or the specific time could have been different. But it was just it was just asking for disruption. And now that we have multiple disruptions, uh, I do think this is going to be a more challenging decade in terms of the, the chance that you go to a store and they have exactly what you want in any color you want, for example, as just like a privilege case, that's ch more challenging now. And then obviously the more extreme event, some people have trouble with even just getting food, just getting food at reasonable prices. And so there's a big spectrum for how, how badly people could be affected. Then you can add things like, you know, uh, uh, a cyber tax, you know, right? So, so there's all sorts of things that can go wrong. And so one of the things I've been recommending is that people should have reasonable stockpiles of things they need, right? So don't assume that the global supply chain is going to work perfectly efficiently all the time. So because companies don't have very big inventory, I think households should have decent inventory. They should try to offset the lack of resiliency in global supply chains by having their own inventories. Uh, but of course, the challenge is that not everybody can build an inventory at the same time. If everybody at this, if, if everybody tries to hoard, that's when price, that's when shelves go bare right away. So I think the key thing is to try to, you know, do mild gradual hoarding over time where you, you build up, you know, you build up uh, what you have, what we, you know, so you can get through multi-week or multi-month periods of severe shortages and things. What are you doing to economically protect yourself? What you know, where are you making sure you're resilient economically? Well, yeah, one is making sure you have all these inventories because even the best case, even so the less dramatic case is just that if you have paper towels and, and you know, uh, non-perishable foods, you know, what are the chances that the price of those things are going to go down in the next couple of years, right? So, so it's just a, it's a better inflation adjusting cash than cash. So that's, that's if, if you just never need to rely on the stockpiles, there's that. And of course, the worst case scenario is it, it keeps you more comfortable and safe during during more severe periods. So there's that. And then two, for investments, just being diversified and having things that, that benefit from inflation and that protect you from inflation. So for example, if you're worried about energy prices, you can own energy companies. If you're worried about you know commodity prices, you can have commodity companies. Uh, you can have you know things like gold and Bitcoin to protect you from devaluing fiat currencies. And, and there are multiple ways to play it, depending on how much volatility and how much diversification or concentration someone wants in their portfolio. But I think the emphasis is on being defensive, being diversified, and being resilient against uh, an inflationary decade. Even though, I mean, there will be periods of time where some of those inflation hedges are overdone, right? So everybody rush out and buy energy stocks, and then you know, maybe you get some sort of de-escalation in the conflict, and you know, you go through a year where, the, where those investments don't work out well. But then, like I said, you could have fiscal stimulus and you have you kind of come out the other side, even even higher prices. And so it won't be a straight line, but I, I generally uh, still prefer inflationary types of assets. Do you want to know one thing about crypto? I made over 3000 percent in profit in a few weeks. Fact is, the traditional financial system, the traditional money system makes you poor, not rich. If you want to earn $500,000, million, you have to wait until you're 50, 60, 70. In the traditional financial system, 
and you probably will still be broke and you will be old. This is not a sexy combination as you can imagine. But the question is, how can you start in crypto and make these profits? Where to invest? Where to start? My name is Gunnar and I'm from Germany as you can hear and things are a little bit different in Germany. More about that later on. The fact is, there are lots of different cryptocurrencies. It's a gigantic universe where beginners and professionals get easily lost. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. There are seven key steps you need to follow to become successful in this market. You have to know them and if you fail one of them, it's literally impossible to succeed in this market. Just an example, one of the key points is your exchange and one of the biggest are for example Binance and Coinbase. These are trusted and well established exchanges but, and this is a big but, you won't find the super profitable coins on those exchanges. The unknown super profitable coins that get gigantic profits are not traded on those kind of exchanges. They are traded on much smaller insider platforms that are barely known. And I can tell you what those super secret exchanges are and why they are so profitable. And another super important thing are the right information sources. The point is, the internet is gigantic. There are hundreds and hundreds of YouTube channels, blogs, pages and much much more. And there are also market makers and influencers. For example, Elon Musk, he is not a crypto guy. But the moment he recommended Dogecoin, it went through the roof. To the moon, so to say. But why did he recommend it? Where did he hear it from? He didn't hear it from newspapers. And believe me, he is listening to someone. But you have to know who and you have to react before he is reacting. This is really, really important. And these are only two of the seven steps you have to follow in order to be successful in crypto. And if you want to know all of these steps in much more detail and if you want to have a comprehensive checklist, here's what you should do. There is a link below this video. Click on this link and you will get the opportunity to subscribe to my channel. Click on the link and you will see a video where I explain the next steps. So see you soon. Click on the link now. I'll see you there.